Remarkable improvements have occurred in services to persons with disabilities over the past 50 years. Since 1964, the National Association of State Directors of Developmental Disability Services has played a pivotal role in the change process by providing visionary leadership, systemic innovations, and the development of national, home, and community-based policies and practices. The idea of forming a national organization to represent state mental retardation agencies was a byproduct of the momentum created by President John F. Kennedy and his administration in laying a foundation for a nationwide campaign to combat mental retardation. We now use the term intellectual disabilities, but until the 1970s, the vernacular was mental retardation. In the early 1960s, the needs of persons with mental retardation emerged from the shadowy recesses of individual family struggles and were thrust into the spotlight of national attention. Long-standing assumptions concerning the federal government's role were being challenged. The states, in turn, began to question their out-of-sight, out-of-mind approach to serving children and adults with mental retardation in segregated classrooms and huge, overcrowded institutions. One of President Kennedy's initial actions after assuming office was to appoint a blue ribbon panel to study the nation's response to mental retardation and recommend steps to improve research, prevention, and treatment programs nationwide. The panel's report contained 112 recommendations for improving federal research, training, and service programs nationwide, thus heralding a sharply stepped up federal involvement in financing mental retardation activities. In response to the panel's report, a group of state officials with major responsibilities for mental retardation services met in Columbus, Ohio in February 1963 to discuss state mental retardation planning. The organization was subsequently incorporated as the National Association of Coordinators of State Programs for the Mentally Retarded in January 1964. In 1977, the organization's name was changed to the National Association of State Mental Retardation Program Directors. The current name of the organization, the National Association of State Directors of Developmental Disability Services, was adopted in 1992. The federal government's role in human services grew rapidly during the latter half of the 1960s after President Johnson launched a war on poverty and sought to create a great society. Many landmark statutes were enacted during this period, including laws authorizing such programs as Medicare, Medicaid, federal aid to elementary and secondary schools, and Head Start. The overcrowding and inhumane conditions in public institutions also gained media attention during this period. Well, I visited the state institutions for the mentally retarded, and I think that particularly at Willowbrook that we have a situation that borders on uh, a snake pit. A year later, Christmas in Purgatory was published, a candid photographic essay revealing the deplorable conditions in the back wards of state mental retardation institutions. These media exposés sparked a deinstitutionalization movement led by families and professionals with proponents of change calling for closing public institutions and replacing them with statewide networks of alternative community-based services for people with disabilities. The battles that ensued resulted in dozens of landmark court rulings vindicating the rights of individuals with disabilities, as well as a plethora of progressive state legislation. In 1970, the National Association of Coordinators of State Programs for the Mentally Retarded hired its first executive director, Robert Gettings. After serving as the association's executive director for over 36 years, Bob retired in 2007. He was replaced by Nancy Thaler, a former deputy secretary of mental retardation in Pennsylvania. Association members played an instrumental role in the passage of 1971 legislation authorizing an optional Medicaid coverage of intermediate care services for persons with mental retardation. In subsequent years, organization leaders worked closely with federal officials, 
in developing, implementing regulations and administrative policies, including conditions of participation, certification standards, the definition of related conditions, and the circumstances under which small community residences could be certified as ICF's MR. Even today, the ICF IDD coverage option remains a critical feature of federal law since it serves as the statutory raison d'etre for claiming federal Medicaid reimbursement for all home and community-based waiver services. President Nixon signed the Developmental Disabilities Act into law in 1970. As an active participant in the National Consortium concerned with developmental disabilities, the association played a central role in shaping the early history of Developmental Disabilities Act programs. The consortium's work led to the addition of federal support for state protection and advocacy systems in 1975 and to the adoption by Congress of a non-categorical definition of the term developmental disability in 1978. Beginning in the 1970s, litigation became a critical factor in shaping public policy towards individuals with developmental disabilities. The association staff tracked the status of dozens of right to treatment and related class action lawsuits from the 1970s through the 1990s and worked closely with member state agencies in developing strategies to respond to these lawsuits. The results of this work are evident in the steep decline in the census of state-run IDD institutions over the past 45 years. Today, 14 states in the District of Columbia no longer have a publicly operated IDD institution. After Congress passed Public Law 94-142, the Education for All Handicapped Children's Act of 1975, educational opportunities for children with developmental disabilities changed dramatically. Regardless of the degree of disability, the act said, no school-age child could be denied a free, appropriate public education. The association was part of a large coalition that backed the passage of the act. It took nearly two decades for local school systems to fulfill the Education for All mandate. In 1981, Congress enacted a measure aimed at significantly reducing federal entitlement and discretionary spending. Buried within this massive legislation called the Omnibus Budget Reconciliation Act was a little-noticed statutory amendment authorizing the U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services to approve waivers of Medicaid law that would allow states to claim Title 19 reimbursement for home and community-based services on behalf of individuals at risk of placement in Medicaid-certified long-term care institutions. The association played an instrumental role in convincing Congress to include habilitation as an eligible HCB waiver coverage, thus making it clear that the waiver authority was intended to promote home and community-based alternatives for frail elders, individuals with physical disabilities, and persons with developmental disabilities. The success of these efforts is evident today by the fact that over half of the $34.4 billion in federal IDD aid received by the states is derived from the home and community-based waiver payments. The association began providing technical assistance to member state agencies in the late 1970s. These efforts intensified during the 1980s following the enactment of the Medicaid Home and Community-Based Waiver Authority. In 1988, the association hired Gary Smith to serve as Director of Special Projects. Smith was responsible for providing technical assistance to member state agencies and summarizing cutting-edge policies and practices. In 1994, Robin Cooper joined the association staff in order to address the growing demand for technical assistance services. By the 1980s, a new social change movement was already underway, the self-advocacy movement. Persons with developmental disabilities were organizing locally, statewide, nationally, and internationally, proclaiming, we are people first, just as the parents had fought to assume the power once exclusively held by professionals, individuals with disabilities were now demanding to be heard. 
During the 1990s, NASDDDS worked closely with the states selected to participate in a self-determination project funded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. In addition to inviting self-advocates to present at association meetings, NASDDDS published groundbreaking reports on self-directed services entitled Managing Our Own Supports and on individual budgeting strategies entitled Having It Your Way. The association also worked closely with CMS officials to broaden participant direction options under the Medicaid Home and Community-Based Waiver Program and issued a set of guidelines for involving self-advocates in meetings and other forums where public policies were being discussed. The association was one of a handful of national organizations that were at the table when congressional leaders decided to prohibit discrimination against individuals with disabilities in federally funded programs. Delays in issuing regulations implementing Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 led to the formation of a national disability rights movement. The movement not only forced the executive branch to issue detailed regulations and enforcement mechanisms, but, more importantly, elevated disability policy to a level that national policymakers were no longer able to ignore. A better organized, more assertive disability community eventually convinced Congress to enact the Americans with Disabilities Act in 1990. This legislation extended the non-discrimination principles of Section 504 to the private sector as well as to state and local government programs and activities. In 1985 and 86, association representatives played a critical role in convincing Congress to define the term habilitation services for purposes of the Medicaid Home and Community-Based Waiver Program to include daytime habilitation and supported employment services. Later, at the urging of NASDDDS, Congress expanded participation in these so-called extended habilitation services from previously institutionalized individuals only to all waiver participants with developmental disabilities. In 1999, the U.S. Supreme Court found that institutionalization represented a constitutionally impermissible form of segregation when an individual is capable and desirous of living in the community. The U.S. Supreme Court's ruling in Olmstead v. L.C. spawned a series of initiatives, first by the Clinton administration and later by the George W. Bush and Obama administrations. The common thread running through these initiatives is that the full resources of the federal government should be harnessed to promote home and community-based services for individuals of all ages, types, and severity of disability. NASDDDS has worked closely with federal officials and member state agencies in designing and carrying out Olmstead initiatives over the past 15 years. By the mid-2000s, it became evident that despite the association's legislative efforts, the number of individuals with developmental disabilities participating in competitive and supported employment had either plateaued or declined in many states. In 2006, in partnership with ICI at UMass Boston, NASDDDS launched the State Employment Leadership Network. This learning community of 29 state IDD agencies worked together to improve employment opportunities and outcomes. The network is a place where states can connect, collaborate, problem solve, and share resources. A recent analysis of data from the ICI National Survey of Day and Employment Services found that between 2007 and 2012, the percentage of individuals receiving integrated employment services increased in SELN member states, while the percentage of people in integrated employment services in non-participating states decreased. National Corps Indicators began in 1997 as a collaborative effort between NASDDDS and the Human Services Research Institute. The goal of the program was to encourage and support member state agencies to develop a standard set of performance measures that could be used by states to manage quality, benchmark progress from one year to the next, and make comparisons across states. Fifteen states initially stepped forward to work on the Core Indicators project. 
as it was originally known, and pooled their resources to develop valid and reliable data collection protocols. Over time, NCI has become an integral piece of many states' quality management systems. With the support of the Administration on Community Living, NCI has grown to 42 states and 22 regions and counties. As a small organization with limited staff resources, NASDDDS leaders have come to recognize over the years the benefits of joining forces with other organizations that have shared goals and complementary capabilities. These collaborations expand the impact of the association in emerging areas of policy and practice in ways that otherwise would lie beyond the organization's capabilities. Over the past 25 years, the product of these joint ventures have included a groundbreaking guidebook on the application of managed health care practices to the delivery of long-term supports to individuals with developmental disabilities, the development and operation of a website that gives interested individuals across the nation easy online access to information on a rich array of best practices in the organization, financing, and delivery of public IDD services. The joint sponsorship of periodic disability summits to reach consensus regarding the best strategies for advancing the IDD public policy agenda. The development of an online HCB waiver application template in collaboration with CMS and other affected state executive branch agencies. The creation of a participant-centered process of managing and assessing the quality of home and community-based services in cooperation with CMS and other state executive branch agencies an analysis of person-centered service delivery practices in cooperation with researchers at Virginia Commonwealth University, Support Development Associates, and six pilot states, and the development of more flexible, resilient systems to support the families of persons with developmental disabilities. The past 50 years unquestionably has yielded major advances in public policy and attitudes towards individuals with developmental disabilities. But many challenges lie ahead. Over the past half century, NASDDDS has developed effective strategies for leveraging progressive changes in public policy and maintained the association at the cutting edge of change in the developmental disabilities field continued commitment and solidarity of purpose on the part of member state agencies is the key to sustaining this progress and building on the successes of the past.